you, Ellen. We are really excited to have Judge Julie Robinson with us today. Julie is a fourth generation Kansan and the first African American named to the U.S. District Court of the District of Kansas. She attended Kansas University for her undergraduate and her AD degree and was later a trial practice instructor at the law school and president of its board of directors. After law school, Julie Robinson was a law clerk, the U.S. bankruptcy judge, Benjamin Franklin, and then became an assistant U.S. attorney handling civil and criminal cases. When Judge Franklin died, Judge Robinson was appointed to fill his vacancy on the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the, Kansas, uh, for the District of Kansas, where she served for eight years. In 2001, President George W. Bush appointed Judge Robinson to the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas. She now sits on the federal bench in Kansas City. Judge Robinson is a fellow of the American Bar Association and received the Distinguished Public Service Award from Baker University and the Distinguished Service Award from the Kansas Bar Association. Judge Robinson is a past chair of the Court Administration and Case Management Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. She's a member of the Federal Judiciary Workplace Conduct Working Group and is chair of the Board of Healing House, an addiction recovery program in the Metro KC area. As you can tell, she has a very full plate. So we're very appreciative of her time to spend with us this morning on a Saturday morning. We thank you, Judge Robinson, for being here. Thank you for all you do for our local and greater community. Judge Julie Robinson. Kathy left out one very important piece of information about my career trajectory. Um, I was a law clerk. Um, um, at the end of law school with Terry Matlack, Kathy's husband, who's here somewhere. And, uh, so I would say my first legal job, I uh, sat next door to, or right by Terry in a, in a shared cubicle uh, for a law firm called uh, Schneider, Schoenberg, and May in Fairway. So and Terry helped me launch my legal career. Um, so, you know, when federal judges um, construe statutes, interpret statutes, trying to figure out what did the legislature mean when they wrote this particular language, we often turn to dictionaries, and not legal dictionaries, just ordinary dictionaries, um, to determine what they mean when they wrote this. So when I was asked to talk about empowerment of women, the first place I turned to was Webster's. Um, and one of the definitions of empowerment, or to empower, is to make someone stronger and more confident especially in controlling their life and claiming their rights. And so let's talk about that, confidence. How, to, how do we become confident and how do we become stronger as individuals because that's how we become empowered. Confidence is something that we all struggle with. At least we hope that we all struggle with it. I think we've all met people that perhaps never seem to struggle with it, but <laughs> by and large, <laughs> Confidence is something that we all struggle with. I'm reminded of a story that Dwight Eisenhower told in his book, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends. By 1948, Dwight Eisenhower, in everybody's estimation, was a rock star. He was a decorated general. He had led the Allied uh, forces um, invading France on D-Day. So in 1948, Columbia University comes to Dwight Eisenhower and asks him to consider becoming their president. And his reaction was to resist. He ultimately did become their president, but he was very reluctant to take this on because he felt inadequate. He felt a lack of confidence. He thought about all of these academics roaming around the, the campus of Columbia University in New York, and he thought about his roots as a Kansas boy, and he thought about the fact that he graduated firmly in the middle of his class at West Point. <laughs> And he decided that he just couldn't keep up. He wasn't smart enough, that they were going to figure out that he wasn't smart enough, and that maybe if some you know, rural or Midwest college came at calling to his door, he might do that at Columbia University. He suffered from a lack of confidence. Dwight Eisenhower. And I'm reminded of a story about a man named Neil. 
Um, and there was a man named Neil Gaiman, and he was a scientist, and he talks about going to a conference of high achieving scientists, and he's standing in the back of a ballroom of all of these folks, and he's standing back there, and he's standing next to an older man who he did not know, and they begin to talk, and Neil Gaiman is thinking, you know, I don't belong here. I feel so out of place. These people are rock stars. What am I doing here? So he's talking to this man that's standing next to him, and this older man he discovers, his name is Neil, too. So they start talking about the fact that they're there, and this older man named Neil says, I don't know what I'm doing here. These are all people that have discovered amazing things, they're doing amazing work, and all I ever did was go where I was told to go. <laughs> and younger Neil says to older Neil, you were the first man on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from something. <laughs> I think as women, though, we struggle more because there are external forces that impair, impede our level of confidence. There's microaggressions, there's implicit bias, there's overt sexism, there's covert sexism. And these external forces work on us. They impair our ability to be confident. Michelle Obama put it this way, women endure entire lifetimes of these indignities in the form of catcalls, groping, assault, oppression. These things injure us. They sap our strength. Some of the cuts are so small, they're barely visible. Others are huge and gaping, leaving scars that never heal. Either way, we accumulate. We carry this stuff with us. Cheryl Sandberg wrote in her book, Leaning In, every time I was called on in class, I was sure I was about to embarrass myself. Every time I took a test, I thought it had gone badly. And every time I didn't embarrass myself or even excelled, I believed that I had fooled everyone yet again. <laughs> One day, the jig would soon be up, she writes. And when Sonia Sotomayor um, entered, the, um, entered as a freshman at, at Princeton University as an undergraduate, she said that she felt like a visitor landing in an alien country. She said that, and now keep in mind, she graduated, I believe, second in her class at Princeton four years later. But she said in her first year at Princeton, she was so intimidated, so embarrassed, that she never raised her hand, not once, not in a single class. She was scared that they would know that she was an imposter and that she didn't belong there. I've had these feelings, and I'm guessing all of you have. Um, I graduated from law school one month before my 24th birthday, and then I went to clerk for a bankruptcy judge for two years, which was a very affirming and comfortable environment to be in, being mentored by a judge. But then I was hired as an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I remember arriving to work that first day, and they show me my office, and there's just all these boxes full of case files, and they say, here you go. Here's your case load. <laughs> and, um, you know, cases in every, uh, every uh, phase of, of a case, from the beginning of filing to the end, cases that were ready for trial, cases that needed briefing on some judgment motions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I share this story with young lawyers and law students now, and they say, that's terrifying. I'm like, of course it was. I was terrified. I didn't know what I was doing, and I felt like a complete imposter. And that job in particular was a fertile ground for the imposter syndrome. Now, you've probably heard this term before, the imposter syndrome. It was a, a term that was coined by a clinical psychologist in 1978 to describe people that have an inability to internalize their accomplishments. Um, people that have a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. And um, the early research on imposter syndrome focused on high-achieving individuals, and in particular, high-achieving women. But as they continued to conduct this research, they discovered that 70% of women and men, 70% of individuals, at least at some point in their life, had felt like they were an imposter, that they were a fraud, that they were not equipped to do what they were expected to do. Um, research also suggests, though, that it more strongly afflicts women people of color, and people that are perceived as other. Dr. Valerie Brown has wrote that there are really five types of personalities that you see in people that are suffering from the imposter syndrome. 
So there's the perfectionist, there's the superwoman who compensates by trying to outwork everyone. There's the natural genius. This is someone who's maybe skated through life and is very bright and has done very well, but they don't handle any sort of failure or any sort of challenge well, and so they don't push themselves to do anything new that might challenge them. There is the expert who's constantly seeking out trainings and certifications because they think they're never going to be an expert enough at whatever they're called to do. They're constantly looking for ways to improve their skills because they don't believe their skills are good enough. And there is the soloist. This is the person that says, I can do it on my own. I'm not going to let anybody know what I'm doing. I don't want anyone to think I can't do it on my own. I'm a little island to myself, and I'll, I'll figure out how to get through this. I was afflicted with the imposter syndrome, probably for the first time really in law school. And I remember one incident in particular that sort of illustrates how you compensate by being a perfectionist. So in order to get on law review, you either have to have really good grades, top of your class, or you can write on. There's a competition, a writing competition. So I got my question like everyone else did, and I wrote my paper, and I didn't think it was good enough, and I didn't think it was perfect enough, so I didn't turn it in. Oh. And um, it's incapacitating. It's that you know imposter syndrome manifesting as a, as a perfectionist that in my case incapacitated me I took myself out of that competition. Um, I was afflicted with the imposter syndrome when I was an assistant U.S. attorney. Um, I was afflicted um, with the imposter syndrome when, at the age of 37 when I became a bankruptcy judge. I had almost no bankruptcy experience other than the two years I had spent with Judge Benjamin Franklin. Um, and so the imposter syndrome flared up again. And even at the age of 44, when I was appointed as a district judge, Although I will say by then I was firmly, I thought, in recovery. There were times. <laughs> there were times it flared up again. Um, I would say even now, very infrequently, but every once in a while it flares up again. So you might ask, how do you begin recovery from the imposter syndrome? Because it's the same question, I think, is how you become empowered. How do you gain confidence? How do you become strong? How, as an individual, do you become empowered? Well, first of all, a lot of it comes from within. And when you talk about imposter syndrome, you're talking about people that cannot seem to internalize their achievements and their, their success. So part of it is being able to internalize that, being able to, or maybe forcing yourself to take stock of your achievements. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we, we denigrate ourselves or we don't uh, give ourselves credit for all of the great things that we do. And one of the first steps, of course, is to not do that and to start to internalize and to take stock of all of your achievements. Um, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, I tried, I never can remember exactly, it was over 35 jury trials, civil and criminal. If you talk to young lawyers today, they'll tell you they won't try 35 cases in their lifetime. Cases don't go to trial like they used to. But this was during an era that people tried cases, so I got that kind of experience. And I knew at some point that I had begun recovery during those years when I was a trial lawyer. When I was in trial, it was a complex tax fraud case. And I was you know, the only government lawyer on the other side, the defense side of the um, courtroom, were a very seasoned defense lawyer heading a whole defense team of lawyers. So there were lawyers on that team that were tax experts. I was not. And the lead attorney had been a trial lawyer, I think, for 30 or 35 years at that point. And let's just say he had an abundance of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> and that particular trial, I think it dawned on me, I'm getting better. Um, so you talk about microaggressions. So what this lawyer did during this trial, um, he would refer to everybody by their title. So there was Judge Smith. And there was Mr. Jones, and there was Ms. You know, Walters, and on and on and on. Everybody had a title in that courtroom but me. Every time he referred to me, every time he mentioned my name, every time he referred to me, it was Julie. Not Ms. Robinson, Julie. And I looked up at the judge thinking he was going to intervene, and he was oblivious. Okay? So this is how I knew I was in recovery. This is a microaggression. We've all encountered these things. We've all, we've all um, had this happen to us in one way or another. But I knew I was in recovery because instead of internalizing it and being upset and being hurt and thinking, well, you know, 
I am younger than him, and I'm less experienced, and you know, he shouldn't do this, but you know, oh, woe is me. Instead of doing that, I decided that I was going to get him back. <laughs> so this is what I did. So I know Terry has tried cases. For those of you that have been trial lawyers um, in a jury trial, you know, you're, you're communicating through body language in a lot of ways with the jury. So, every time I would get up and start speaking and I would have to address or refer to anybody, I would say, now, Mr., let's just say I had a witness on the stand, Mr. so-and-so. And when I would say Mr., I would emphasize the Mr., and then I'd kind of mug the jury and look at them. <laughs> or Ms., and I'd mug the jury and look at them. Well, it didn't take very long before the jury got what I was doing, because the next time that other counsel got up, it was Julie again. And so he'd say Julie, and I'd look at him, and they'd look at me, and at first they laughed. At first they laughed because they got what I was doing. And then I started watching, and as he continued to do this, because he was oblivious that this was going on, you could see the anger in the jury. They got what was happening, and they were offended just like I was. And that told me that I was in recovery, because I wasn't internalizing. I was fighting back. <laughs> So part of confidence building comes from within, but I'm convinced that more of it comes from without. Just as those external forces can impair us and incapacitate us if we don't allow them, <coughs> external forces can help us become empowered as well. And um, I had great mentors, most of them, because it's a male-dominated profession, were men, male judges in particular, and they helped me tremendously by giving me encouragement and feedback on my work. But frankly, the biggest factor um, was my girlfriends. So when I was in the US Attorney's Office, again, they're mostly men lawyers, but there were two other women that um, I became lifelong friends with, Karen and Jan. And as our friendship evolved and as we got to know each other, um, we learned that we were all sort of suffering with this imposter syndrome. Now, for a while, we suffered alone in silence. Our friendship evolved. Um, we did a lot of great things together. We helped each other. But yet, the three of us were little islands, all thinking that we were imposters. I thought that Jan and Karen were superstars. And I didn't want them to know that I wasn't you know, as smart as them. Meanwhile, they thought the same thing about each other. Um, so one day, we had a breakthrough. We were talking. And we started sharing our feelings about feeling inadequate and feeling like we didn't measure up. And it was earth-shattering, really. We allowed ourselves to become vulnerable enough to share our feelings. And that became, or that started what we um, now call the imposter club. <laughs> and so we formed the imposter club, just the three of us, and that's what we called ourselves 30 years ago or so. And from time to time, even today, we still convene the imposter club. Our mission continues to be to encourage each other, our mission continues to be to lift one another up, and when one of us says something that an imposter would say, like, man, you know, I don't think I'm smart enough to take on this new project, the other two say, oh, yes, you are. Um, and that's, that's the agenda always with our imposter club. So we continue to do this, and we probably will do this for life. Now, Jan, my friend, has retired um, just recently, last summer. She, um, at the time she retired, was the chief bankruptcy judge for the district. She followed me on the bankruptcy bench. Um, our other friend, Karen, is Karen Arnoldberger, who is the chief of the Kansas Court of Appeals. I have permission to share this story with, with, with you all. We are all actually proud of the fact that we have this imposter club. Um, and we now call ourselves the three chiefs because we, you know, at one point we're all uh, chief judges, but we also call ourselves the imposter club. Um, so how do we empower one another? How do we empower women in particular? How do we encourage confidence and discourage feelings of inadequacy and discourage fear of failure? Among the steps that Karen and Jan and I took were these. First, you have to accept that it is natural for any of us to at times feel inadequate, or to feel like we don't fit in, or feel like we're not the smartest person in the room, um, or even close to the smartest person in the room. Um, I remember once when I was a prosecutor, I went to a conference, it was in a big ballroom, it was supposed to be state, local, and federal law enforcement types, and that included not only law enforcement types, police and agents and sheriffs, etc., but prosecutors. So there's this big ballroom, there's 250 or so people in there, 248 men, 
two women. Um, one was me and one was Carla Stovall, who later went on to become the first um, woman attorney general for the state of Kansas. And I would see Carla after that um, from time to time and we'd laugh about it. But the, the truth is, when you're in a ballroom of 250 people and only two of you are women, you're going to feel different. You are going to feel like you stick out. You are going to feel, um, hopefully not inadequate, but feel like you're other and that you perhaps don't fit in. Just acknowledge that that's going to happen. Secondly, develop a new script. You know, we all have these audio scripts in our head, these voices that we hear um, that hopefully are affirming us, but sometimes they're not. Um, so we have to develop a new script, that we are as smart as everyone else, that we are as capable as everyone else, um, that when we see bluster, like I saw in the one um, lawyer that I talked to you about, bluster does not equal intelligence. Bluster is just bluster. And you need to remind yourself and play those voices in your head. Also, that feelings are not facts. Feelings of inadequacy do not mean that you are, in fact, inadequate. Here's a big one. Break the silence. When Jan and Karen and I were friends, we were these little islands, and we didn't talk to each other about these things, and we couldn't help each other. But as soon as we broke the silence and started sharing our feelings with one another, then we could tell one another, feelings are not facts. Of course you're smart enough. Of course you're adequate. Of course you're competent. Um, and together then, once we broke the silence, we were able to recover and to empower one another. Um, another thing is you have to push yourself. You have to stretch your horizons. Um, one of the ways that imposter syndrome manifests itself is people are incapacitated and they're perfectionists or they, they don't want to push themselves with new challenges. They're afraid to, to fail. Once you are in recovery, if you will, from this, you have to make yourself do new things. You have to push yourself. Um, so that you aren't operating as the expert or the perfectionist or the soloist or anything like that. Over the last 18 years, since I've been a district judge and since I've firmly been in recovery, I've realized that I had to push my horizons. And so I've done a number of things that are um, extrajudicial, extracurricular, if you will. Um, I chaired this national committee that um, Kathy mentioned. Um, the, the federal judiciary operates as a board of governors in terms of um, developing policy and how we operate as an institution. And like most boards, the real work is done by the committees. Um, and so I chaired a committee that had really jurisdiction over all court administration and operations. And so we develop policy on just dozens and dozens of important issues for the rest of the judiciary. Something that I didn't, you know, I had to learn about a lot of aspects of the judiciary, you know, a lot about policy making. But taking on that position forced me to do a lot of things that before recovery I would have been afraid to do. It forced me to, for example, testify in front of Congress and meet with members of the House and the Senate about very, uh, various issues pertaining to the federal judiciary. Um, it allowed me the opportunity to work with two Supreme Court justices on a number of projects over the years. It allowed me to work with a number of highly regarded federal judges. It allowed me to travel to other countries to educate other judges, um, particularly in Thailand and South Korea, about our case management systems. Now, before recovery, I would have been so intimidated by all of these highly regarded federal judges and you know, justices of the uh, Korean Supreme Court and our own uh, Supreme Court justices because I would have thought I didn't measure up, I, I wasn't smart enough to even talk to these folks. But forcing myself to do that empowered me because it taught me that I was capable of doing this. So what I have learned in my journey and what I continue to learn because it is a journey is that feelings are not facts. That the smart and the powerful and the accomplished are fallible just like anyone else. That feeling insecure at times is normal, but we cannot allow it to be defining or limiting or incapacitating that we need to change the script in our heads and continue to work on that. But perhaps more importantly, we need people in our lives that will encourage us and that hopefully we in turn can encourage. We need to form our own imposter club, whatever that may look like. And that when we're in recovery, when we're doing better at these things, we have to continue to push ourselves and continue to grow our confidence recognizing that empowerment and confidence is not a destination, it's always a journey. So thank you. Frankly, being here today is pushing myself a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for helping me become more empowered. <laughs>